Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Osage University Partners inaugural webinar. Uh, my name is Bill Harrington, one of the managing partners at OUP, and will be your moderator today. Um, please note that this webinar is being recorded and all participant lines are muted. If you're listening over the phone, you can press star zero for help. And for technical assistance with the web portion of today's program, please email osage at compartners.com or send a message in the chat box to the left of your screen. Today, we're having a conversation on venture investment in the medical device sector with our panelists, Mike Carusi from Lightstone Ventures and Hanson Gifford from The Foundry, both of which I have known personally for a long, long time, and both of whom represent some of the most active uh, investment entities in medical devices today and over the past couple decades. Uh, the way the webinar will be structured is we'll show a quick slide with some data on medical device investing trends, followed by about 40 to 45 minutes of a panel discussion and Q&A. For those of you who submitted questions prior to the webinar, thank you, and our panelists will begin by discussing those. If you've not submitted questions and you'd like to, you can queue up a question for us at any time during the presentation. Simply type into the chat box to the left of the screen and click the send button. A recorded version of this webinar will be available in the form of a URL <clears throat> to the archived online event and as an MP4 file. The link and file are available on request. Uh, we'll begin with Matt Cohen, uh, principal here at OUP, who will present a slide on medical, uh, medical device investment trends over the last couple decades to set the stage for discussion with Mike and Hanson. Great. Thank you, Bill. So uh, essentially wanted to uh, uh, set the stage by providing some data on the medical device and equipment investment uh, uh, space uh, over the last 20 years. And so what we're showing on the slide is uh, seed and early stage deals or investments in, in the medical device and equipment sector uh, from 1995 through uh, 2016 year to date. In the blue bars, uh, you, you see a uh, number of deals or deal count. <coughs> And the green line is the total dollars invested uh, uh, in, in sum across all of those deals. And essentially what you can see over the last 20 years or so is a, you know, a, a, a fluctuating but, but relatively flat uh, a number of deals that fluctuates anywhere from roughly uh, 100 deals to 175 deals per year. And total capital invested, you know, at, at peak of sort of uh, 2008, 2009, you know, roughly uh, 1.2 billion. Uh, but over the last sort of 10 years, sort of has begun to decline uh, and has has slowly been trending down towards the, uh, you know, 700 to uh, 900 million dollar capital invested uh, sort of per year range. So. Um, you know, while, while uh, uh, the medical device sector is certainly not as uh, hot of an investment sector as perhaps therapeutics, uh, you know, the data does support that there is investment activity in the space and uh, hopefully today during the discussion with our two panelists we'll be able to begin to tease out uh, where that investment is, is actually occurring and hopefully help uh, everyone on the phone understand better uh, where they could best focus their efforts going forward. Thanks a lot, Matt. Um, Hanson and Mike, before diving into questions, I'd like each of you just to take a few minutes and introduce yourselves and your firms um, and kind of what you tend to focus on and how that might have been, how that might have changed over the past several years. Um, while they're doing that, uh, for the audience, if you have questions, now would be a good time to submit them. Uh, Hanson, do you want to start us off? Sure, happy to, uh, <clears throat> Bill. Uh, my name is Hanson Gifford, and uh, I am a partner at The Foundry, which is uh, often referred to as an incubator, but frankly, we are a very small group of serial entrepreneurs. We formed The Foundry back in 1998 uh, with a handful of, uh, of us as partners. Uh, 
<clears throat> and we each had, uh, by that point, already 10 or 15 years of experience in medical device development, uh, taking things from early ideas through development, commercialization, and uh, acquisition of those companies. So we'd, we had seen the process a few times. And our goal in 1998 was to uh, try to pick better companies, uh, better ideas to pursue from the start, to put those together with uh, the very best uh, technologies, the best uh, teams, the, the right financing sources, and uh, by, by getting things off to the very best start possible, hope to improve the, the odds of success. So uh, <clears throat> weren't sure exactly how that was going to work, but uh, over time it, uh, it has. Uh, we have started uh, about uh, 20 companies at the foundry and a second incubator, which we started along the way, called Foresight Labs, focused on ophthalmology. And uh, these have essentially all been really uh, traditional therapeutic medical device companies, uh, catheter-based devices or implantable devices for uh, uh, therapeutic treatment of, of conditions really across, across the body, uh, several in the cardiovascular space, but uh, also a uh, couple in uh, <clears throat> uh, orthopedics, a couple in pulmonology, a couple in uh, uh, neuro, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, several at uh, Foresight Labs in ophthalmology. So we um, have typically uh, <clears throat> either identified an idea or invented one ourselves. We do a lot of, of inventing ourselves at the foundry, but it's frankly always a mix. Uh, there's a, a synchronicity of invention, and our, uh, you know, we, we have an idea that we think comes from nowhere, but actually the antecedents are there, and other people are inventing the same things. So we always have a very intensive IP focus and uh, look around and license things from, from outside uh, and uh, bring together as, as robust a, a patent position as possible. And likewise, if we bring in an idea from outside, we're also inventing to try to optimize that idea. Uh, so uh, we, we typically form the company. We, as, as the principals, uh, will have some common stock. Uh, if the idea is coming from outside, we will uh, license or acquire the IP through you know, a range of, of licensing or, or uh, arrangements. Uh, and we have licensed uh, several technologies from different universities over the years, both a few different UCs, uh, Columbia, I'm trying to think of others, but uh, but but a number of, of university licensing deals. And um, <coughs> uh, then we uh, ourselves lead that company typically for the first year or two, putting together the the development team, guiding the development building out the business plan over time as that project builds momentum and the risk is reduced and we raise more money, we're able to bring in uh, senior leadership to, to guide the company and uh, gradually we segue out uh, remaining in board roles and as advisors to the company but backing off enough that we can start thinking about the next one. So. It's uh, really a, a rolling process of serial entrepreneurship, and um, over the years we've been, been fortunate uh, <clears throat> that uh, you know the, the companies we've started have, have attracted fantastic teams, and those teams have gone on to uh, to great successes with several of those companies. So I may I'll stop there and uh, hand off to Mike. So th <coughs> thanks, Hanson. Yep, yeah, Bill, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, you, want to, you know, one, one thing I wanted to mention, though, and Hanson's quite modest, but, you know, many of those companies exited uh, in the hundreds of millions to, I think, one was just around or over a billion dollars. So success with a capital S with what the Foundry's been able to accomplish, which is really quite remarkable. So, Mike, um, why don't we hear about your, your background and, and what, uh, what you're up to at Lightstone? Yeah, happy to, Bill. So, uh, Mike Carusi, I'm uh, one of the partners here at uh, Lightstone Ventures. Uh, we we actually formed Lightstone Ventures and raised uh, Lightstone Ventures, our first fund, 
of $175 million back in, in 2013. Uh, with that said, the history of, of Lightstone is that we actually took uh, the healthcare teams from two predecessor firms, ATV, which is where I was before, uh, dating back to 1998, and Morgan Thaler, where some of the other partners were, um, and put those two teams together. So collectively, uh, if you look at the four uh, general partners here at Lightstone, we have over 50 years of, of venture experience. And just to give everybody on the phone a sense for why that change occurred, there's a, there's a shift within um, venture towards uh, specialization focus and uh, our predecessor funds invested in both IT and healthcare and even clean tech uh, previously. And we found that over time, the synergies between those various uh, sectors were becoming less and less. And so uh, the decision was made by our two teams to move forward together. And that's, that's not atypical right now. You're seeing a number of um, changes across the venture industry with teams rejiggering and uh, uh, either groups getting much larger where they can play across multiple sectors or um, focusing. So we have a focused early stage healthcare fund. I'd say what differentiates us is that we invest in therapeutics. And I put that in quotes. Therapeutics could be drugs. So uh, about half of what we do is, is biotech and biopharma. That's a portion of what I do personally. But therapeutics to us could also be devices. And I think Hansen alluded to that in, in his reference to therapeutic uh, medical devices. And then more recently, we've even looked at um, broadly defined digital health, but specifically within digital health, again, types of companies that are therapeutic companies. So that would be wearables, therapeutic wearables. And so what we tend to do is invest in companies with therapies uh, at a very early stage. That could be uh, investing in people like Hansen and, and our our team collectively has invested in, I think, 16 or 17 of the foundry companies. Um, it could be investing in um, uh, other entrepreneurs, or we've even uh, internally generated some companies. My partner, Gene George, was a, a founder uh, while at ATV of uh, Zeltique, which had a non-invasive uh, fat removal technology that, that we uh, in licensed out of Harvard, and that company went on to, to be public and currently has a, a market cap of of 1.7 billion. So, um, um, uh, you know, as I said, I focus on both devices and, and biotech early stage. We will typically invest on the order of, of 10 to 15 million over the life of a company. When I say early stage, it could be as early as an entrepreneur with a business plan um, uh, or an idea. Typically, what we invest in is preclinical. Um, and again, we're playing a, a, a role at a very um, early point in time. So as I said, I've been doing this since 1998. Um, I've invested now in over, geez, I don't even know. I, I think over 20 companies have been fortunate that some of those have gone on to, to either be sold or, or uh, get public. Some of them have, have also ended up on the trash heap of, of history. Um, that's part of what we do. Um, uh, so it's a it's a shots on goal kind of game. Um, but that's. Uh, uh, that's my background, and as we get into this bill, I can, you know, if helpful, I can do a little bit of a compare and contrast between what we see on the device side and what we see on the bio biotech side in terms of company creation and, and how we approach things. Great. Well, thank you both. And, and Mike, to think your career started as a ball bearing salesman really speaks to uh, America as the land of opportunity. It also uh, shows you how good of a salesman I am, Bill. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so just I want to start uh, with the graph that, that Matt showed. And, and, you know, whenever you see these aggregated data sets, uh, it looks like things are pretty good. You know, investment, number of investments is, is flat to up a little, dollars maybe down a little, but not too down. And yet, you know, when you talk to people about med tech venture, uh, it's a challenge space. You know, the number of investors actively looking at early stage device companies is down. The dollars going into those companies is down, and, and I think for our university partners, they struggle with, you know, what do we do with early stage med tech opportunities, either IP, early companies, you know, kind of companies they're thinking about forming, which really was the genesis of this discussion. Um, you know, Mike, maybe I'll, I'll stick with you for a minute. Can, can you comment on what you're seeing out in the ecosystem? You've been at this a long time. And, you know, is it is it harder to get these deals done and syndicated and financed? Uh, so the answer is yes. Um, I think it's important to understand why. I, you know, we have a thesis 
uh, within um, Lightstone, I think Hanson and Market Foundry, um, our belief is if you have to ask yourself why has it gotten harder. And, and the reality is, you know, at the end of the day, these these companies need to to be successful, and we need to make money for our investors. That's in some ways we're middlemen. We we raise money from institutions, and we invest those dollars, and, and in turn, our investors expect us to make to make a return. If you look over the past 10 or 15 years, the returns in devices have been paltry. And I think the IRR has been, I don't know, you know, on the order of 4 or 5%. And so as a result, the people that give us money want to see that money go to other places. And, and so the only way you can raise money is, and continue to invest in the space is if you've generated a return there. You know, we've been fortunate that we've been able to, and, and in part thanks to Hanson and Mark's work, um, but the reality is the industry has not. And, and our belief is that if you look back over the past 10 or 15 years, there's been too much in, incremental um, stuff brought to the market. And I think, I think it was in part an overreaction to a tightening FDA and a, and a, and a more challenging environment. And I, and I think what happened is the industry as a whole drifted towards things that were more um, 510K, incremental, easier path through FDA, but I think what we lost sight of was at the end of the day, those products had very little differentiation over what was in the market, and at the end of the day, payers, clinicians, um, uh, patients, uh, FDA didn't really care uh, about the increment, and in fact would actually say, well, that's great, but let's actually see if you can generate sales, and it, it resulted in all of us having to be in these deals longer. And so I think what's happened, Bill, is you've gotten this reaction due to the poor returns, the, the money's moved out, uh, at least on early stage. Um, and our view is it's an overreaction, and if you continue to focus on the highly innovative stuff, that that's where the opportunity is. Now, the reality is we're not seeing as much of that right now uh, because it's hard to raise money. So I, I do think in the past 12 months there's been a shift. I think um, there is a uh, scarcity uh, occurring in the industry. I think there is a recognition that it's probably being underfunded. There's a rec recognition by the major players that they continue to need innovation, and they're knocking on our doors earlier because they, they need to see what's in our pipelines. So I think we're going to see this all shift back um, and hopefully kind of reestablish a, a healthy balance. But until then, you know, there, as you know, there are fewer firms investing. Um, there's uh, less capital out there, and, and the, where the capital is coming from is non-traditional investors, either out of Europe, Asia, strategics. Uh, we've opened offices in Singapore and Dublin to get access to some of those uh, investors, and that's that's been helpful. So although the numbers haven't fallen off a cliff, if you if you were to dig into them, you'd see that the the household names, Bill, that you know you and I know over the past 10 or 15 years are gone. It's a new group of players. Uh, as my partner Hank Plain says, you know, like to say, we needed to make a whole new group of best friends, um, and we've been co-investing with, I'd say, a different group of players over the past, I don't know, two, three years. Let me let me add to that a little bit. Um, you know, the the chart that you showed earlier, Bill, uh, indicated that the number of new startups in medical devices has been uh, roughly uh, flat, but um, I, I would uh, guess that that includes. Uh, a whole new raft of, of digital health companies, and, and that's a potentially really interesting space. But the more traditional uh, invasive medical device uh, industry uh, has seen, I think, a significant drop in the number of startups. And, um, and yet, perhaps a more important slide is the slide of, of acquisitions by, uh, by big companies. And uh, John Salveson has done some great uh, uh, data on that, showing that the number of acquisitions has been absolutely uh, flat, except for dropping in 2009 because of the, uh, the economic situation. It has been absolutely consistent with uh, approximately 55 good exits every year, a quarter of those uh, pre-revenue companies. And uh, so... The, the big strategic companies need new technologies. They have abandoned advanced R&D internally. They want to acquire it. And, and so fewer companies are getting uh, formed. Fewer companies are getting funded. There are fewer VCs out funding them. 
but the acquisition uh, numbers stay the same. So that creates, I think, a fantastic environment for those companies that can get started. Really, really fantastic. And uh, uh, that uh, need for new companies, or new, new technologies from the strategics in a shrinking pool is forcing them to go earlier and earlier. You saw that last year with the flurry of mitral valve uh, company acquisitions where companies were being acquired uh, after just a few human cases. So, uh, so the, the strategics are, are leaning forward, buying earlier, absolutely <coughs> investing more. Their, their investment is, is playing a key role in, in the uh, startup world now. And uh, so although the, the medical device space is a little smaller than it was, uh, I consider it much healthier than it's been in 10 years. Thanks, Hanson. And, and I think, you know, we have seen a real change with the role of strategics. Uh, you know, in the, in the old days, they would come in maybe in a late stage round with a structured deal and some, some strings. Uh, now we're seeing them, you know, come into the earliest financings. And, you know, one of the questions that comes, comes out of that, a number of groups have experimented with the so-called build to buy idea where, you know, you kind of define a problem and a solution in conjunction with one or more strategics and then develop a device uh, around that thesis that has some predefined exit criteria. And I just want to know if in your experience uh, at the Foundry, and Mike, you've seen this at Lightstone, if, if those deals really work, if that strategy, now it's been around for a while, has proved out or not. We hope so. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's um, it's a question of degree. Uh, there have been several build-to-buy projects started over the past uh, four or five years, including one that we started called Fire One, standing for Foundry Ireland One, which we formed with Covidian. And uh, uh, when Medtronic purchased Covidian, they uh, were eager to continue pursuing that. Uh, I think it's still too early to see uh, what the uh, rate of success, what the exits are there. And uh, it's a trade-off between more certain financing and uh, having an interested buyer from the start who is engaged enough to, to learn and to be, uh, to be interested uh, in, uh, in taking the project on in return for often a, a capped uh, upside uh, because there's typically a, a predetermined exit valuation. So uh, it's, it's too early to tell, but I, I think it's, it's going to be an ongoing part of the medical device uh, world for at least the next five years or so, and there's going to be continued experimentation with different uh, models as to how to make that work. I do think it's important in those build-to-buy models to have an option if the uh, strategic at the you know, end of their option period, whether that's three, four, or five years, whatever, reaching a, a clinical milestone, decides not to buy the company, you need to make sure you structure things such that uh, the company can be viable on its own and, and has other potential buyers. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, I think Hanson's right. I think, it's, I think we've seen that model utilized a little bit earlier on the biotech side. Um, and there's been some successful outcomes there as of late. On the device side, we tried earlier. I think one of the problems was the medical device companies were not willing to give us the, the multiple on our investment that we needed to see uh, in order for it to be viable. As, as Hansen said, there's usually a, a predefined multiple. And, and they used to think that two to three X multiple, so the two to three times our cost was a reasonable outcome. And recognizing that 30 or 40 percent of our companies fail, we need to see something usually greater than five times. To, to Hampton's earlier point about scarcity, um, I think the strategics have loosened their criteria on, on that two to three X and are now willing to give us a little bit of a higher multiple, which makes the model, frankly, more viable on, on both sides. And so we did, uh, with Foundry, do Fire One, um, and the economics around that, if, if if exercised are attractive. At the same time, if Medtronic doesn't exercise, uh, Lightstone, along with another venture firm, NEA, um, funded that 
project alongside Medtronic and, and, and Lightstone and NEA have the ability to continue to fund it uh, going forward if, if, uh, if Medtronic does not exercise the option. So, um, I, you know, I think the industry as a whole needs to get more creative. Uh, this is the business development sales guy in me, but I think if you look at the biotech side of the house, there's been a lot more creativity around deal structures and how um, the venture industry and, and startups have worked with um, um, big pharma. And I think the same thing needs to happen on the device side of the house. And I think we're seeing that. I think we're seeing a willingness to get more creative and experiment and try different models. And I, again, I think as groups, as the industry shrinks, I think the relationships between groups like Lightstone, Foundry, and the J&J &J and Medtronics of the world get tighter. And we're able to have those very direct conversations around, gee, how could we um, work together? And, and those, those conversations are occurring. So, so that's great. And so, so for the university... Uh, tech transfer agent who's got, you know, a, a scientist or a physician in their office with an idea, you know, maybe some early prototypes, maybe not, you know, I guess number one is how far do you, re do they really need to develop that before they seek funding from either of you and Hanson probably earlier and Mike probably a little later, uh, but, you know, how far do you have to take a medical device idea before starting to reach out? And, you know, given the convergence of, you know, groups like the Foundry, traditional VCs like Lightstone, and the corporates, you know, who do they reach out to? Well, I would, um, <laughs> I would reach out early and often in, in all directions, frankly. Uh, you know, it used to be that startups were as secretive as possible until they got as far as possible, and then all of a sudden they would uh, uh, announce that they were ready to tell the world and potential acquirers what they were doing and show it to them and expect those acquirers to jump up and uh, and make an offer. And it just doesn't work that way uh, anymore. It takes years for big companies to really get to understand a company and its technology and begin to understand how it might, uh, you know, add to their business. So it's a, a very long courtship process. And um, you know, the, the um, <clears throat> we at the Foundry look at just raw ideas, and our key focus is is you know is this a really big opportunity in terms of uh, of clinical need and and potential uh, market, and is it going to make a dramatic change in the way uh, healthcare is practiced? Is it is it something that if it worked doctors, patients, and so on would say, gosh, I really want to switch to this because uh, the, the healthcare system is under immense pressure and, and costs are being squeezed out and everyone is sticking more and more tightly to their established uh, therapies and, and models and so on. And so it needs to be a dramatic improvement to... Uh, uh, to be <clears throat> for the healthcare system to be willing to adopt it. So that's what we look for, and we're not necessarily looking to see prototypes uh, or animal studies or any of those things, although they're all great. The more progress it's, that's made, the better. Often it's hard to really be clear whether something has promise until you've done some of that work. So I, think, I guess you need to get far enough at least as far as the foundry is concerned, to have some indication that that that, um, that promise of a, of a dramatic change is really there. Yeah, and I, and I, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all answer, Bill. I think, um, um, so I, I'll give you an example because I think it's relevant to, to, the, to the group on the call, and that's um, Ardian, which was um, uh, ultimately uh, founded by Foundry. And, and acquired for um, a nice uh, amount by Medtronic, and Ardian was pioneering the area of renal denervation. The history of how that kind of came together, I think, is interesting. There was two entrepreneurs out of um, Columbia, I guess, right? Columbia, um, yeah. Who approached uh, one of my venture partners at ATV, and they had the original idea of, of renal denervation. They had a different form factor, if you will, they were thinking about a, a device that would do a lidocaine drip, and that's how they were going to 
numb or kill uh, the nerves. And they were thinking about a different area. They were thinking initially to increase urine output for congestive heart failure. And, and so there's a physiologic um, novelty there. And, and so the really big un unknown is, you know, does that physiologic approach work? We were intrigued at ATV with the idea, and that, again, it's really just two entrepreneurs, a doctor and an engineer, but we struggled with the form factor. We weren't quite sure if the, if the um, physiology would match up with the, with the approach, et cetera. And we actually reached out to Hanson and, and Mark at the foundry and said, we think this thing is kind of interesting, but it, it wasn't ready for us to fund it. And Mark and Hanson and the foundry uh, took that project on, advanced it, came back to us nine months, we had some seed funding, came back to us nine months later. And at that point, they had come up with the aha of, you know, rather than doing this lidocaine drip, uh, or at least they had the idea uh, of uh, a catheter-based approach, which was much more in, in keeping with, we thought, a better form factor. So it, it's, it's very iterative, and, um, you know, I think having early discussions with venture capitalists, we may flag things we like, things we don't like. Um, you know, you they may need to go back and do some work or connect with a guy like Hansen to advance the project further. And so it, it's not only a courtship with strategics, it's often a courtship with the venture capitalists as the project gets refined and um, partially de-risked. But it, it, it wasn't greatly de-risked. It was just tightened up in terms of uh, the, the, the form factor and what it might look like. Um, and that's pretty typical with the way we uh, operate, at least at, at Lightstone. Um, Great. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. So, so I mean, it does sound like, you know, uh, early, very early may be appropriate in the right circumstances or at least to seek some feedback on what to do. Um, yeah. And, and you guys mentioned earlier that, you know, one of the reasons there was a downturn in investment activity and, and returns uh, was the fact that too many devices were Me Too, sort of 510K, slightly better in some dimension kinds of devices that were less risky but ultimately proved um, not very attractive to any stakeholder. That kind of leads us to uh, big new ideas, uh, groundbreaking ideas that by definition will be sort of PMA path uh, through the FDA, large clinical trials, uh, maybe more capital requirement um, to do that. You know, one of the questions is, what, well, how have you seen the regulatory environment evolve? You know, at one time, uh, the FDA was the biggest obstacle to medical device innovation. If you could get through the FDA, you almost assumed somebody would buy the device and ultimately the company. Obviously, now you get through the FDA and reimbursement challenges await you. But let's just spend a few minutes on, on the regulatory side for these big new ideas that we do see sometimes coming out of universities like, uh, like Ardian at Columbia. Uh, you know, how, how do you guys look at that? How do you handicap it? Any advice for the listeners on as they think about what to do with ideas for medical devices that are big ideas, you know, how to frame the risks around regulatory tasks? I'll take a stab at that. Um, so uh, the FDA uh, has, uh, you know, gotten tougher over the past uh, 20 years, clearly, and and that's appropriate because the uh, any new technology needs to be better than existing technologies, and as as the state of the art gets better and better, we need better and better trials to make sure that we really are improving healthcare. Uh, and um, so, to, to a certain extent, uh, our industry is, is, uh, is a victim of its own success and that we've created some great technologies in a number of different fields and uh, we need to be better than those in order to, to bring new things forward. So, um, so the, the world has gotten tougher and, and people have talked about the, you know, <clears throat> the pendulum swinging at the FDA. Well, it, it swung in one way for 20 years, which is an awfully tall pendulum if you do your <laughs> physics. Um, it has actually started to uh, to loosen up over the past several years. Uh, the um, uh, the current leadership of the FDA, which which came in uh, after the 2008 election, st 
started off believing that they could regulate uh, the the, uh, the nation to better health, and they've realized that uh, they really can kill off this industry and uh, limit access to great new technologies for the American public. And and they've they've really made a, a sincere and I think successful effort to uh, allow uh, companies to get into clinical trials more quickly in the uh, in the United States to work with companies to design trials that are feasible. Uh, they're still very rigorous. They still want to see uh, you know proof in that trial that the device is safe and efficacious relative to uh, to the alternatives. But uh, there's there's a, a definitely a new attitude at the FDA, which has has been very positive for our industry. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. No. So I I agree, and I, you know, I think Bill, uh, the, at least in the past, there was this distinction made between 510K, you know, less data required, you get FDA approval quicker. You're, you're comparing your device to a predicate, and PMA which by definition is novel, but also bigger trial panel, et cetera. I, I think that's a, a dis distinction that no longer exists anymore. Maybe not in the eyes of FDA, but I think the reality is data is required for any of these devices. And and where I think we've often failed in the past was we had 510Ks get approved quickly, get to market quickly, but they didn't have the data um, that was necessary for payers to reimburse or even for clinicians to adopt. And so from Lightstone's point of view, and I know Hanson agrees with this, in our mind it's all about generating high quality data and, and generating data in comparison to uh, sham uh, studies or to standard of care. And to, to do it not just for FDA, but with an eye towards payers, which has become the bigger challenge. Um, and again, clinicians. And again, our belief is in order to succeed, your product is going to have to be substantially better than whatever it is you're comparing to. And if it's just a little bit better, um, it may or may not get approved by FDA, but it's certainly not going to get paid for. So if you're doing something that's incremental, um, you're, you, there, the belief is it's less risky. I think you're just shifting risk. It may be less risky technically and even clinically, but it's much more risky from a market adoption point of view and a payer point of reimbursement point of view. And I think that's what we've seen is these companies have gone on to get approved, but then they've failed uh, when they actually got to market. And, and they didn't necessarily raise less money. They, you can raise hundreds of millions at that point. And our thesis is if you have a, a novel device, you do a well-controlled trial, and you prove the novel physiology or the novelty of your product, and it's in an area of high strategic demand, that like biotech, you can actually sell your company on that clinical data and you don't have to commercialize uh, yourself, and we've been able to do that um, in, in the past. So we we play the space a little bit more like biotech by going after novelty, by generating high quality data, and then trying to use that data as the catalyst for a uh, a transaction, so that we don't have to fund the commercialization, uh, which adds hundreds of millions to the project if you have to go down that path. And so you both now touched on reimbursement. Um, obviously, that is a bit of the elephant in the room here. And, you know, I think those headwinds seem to be growing, uh, if, if certainly, if anything. Um, you know, how do you try to assess the reimbursement risk and challenge when confronted with a very early stage idea? You know, how should our tech transfer colleagues think about that when they have you know, a doctor in their office with an idea for a new approach, a new device approach to uh, a therapeutic need? So I, I think the answer is it's hard. I, I think, um, so a couple of comments. I, I think, again, the learnings of the past 10 years, what, what I've tended to observe is that if you come back to the clinical data, FDA often wants to see a comparison to a sham, and they're really trying to tease out the science behind it. Payers often don't care about that. What payers care about is a comparison to standard of care, whatever standard of care might be. And what they want to know is, is the new product that you're bringing to market better, and better can be safety, efficacy, and cost, than what they're paying for today. And sometimes you need to run two different studies to tease out those two um, answers. 
And so I think, Bill, where we've gone down is to, to really look at the products and, and think about what is the standard of care and how you're disrupting uh, the standard of care. And then you have to think about all the stakeholders because there's a lot of entrenched politics in all of this. And so, you know, whose who's ox is, is going to get gored? Is it, you know, is it, is it uh, the physicians? Is it, are the hospitals going to do well? I mean, you really have to kind of follow the money. And then I, I think there's just a... There's a characteristic of the deals. For example, deals that have more of what I would call a quality of life component, where there's a need, but it's not life or death. Um, you know, we're finding those those deals are harder to get, or those products are harder to get reimbursed, and so we're shying away from those a little bit, unless we think there's a self-pay path you can go down, because the the payer requirements are quite high for those and very hard to achieve for those types of products versus a, a, a life and death kind of mitral valve, uh, structural heart type of, of product. Um, uh, so we're, we're trying to assess it early on and trying to assess the data needs that, and then assess the likelihood that we can generate that those results in a well-controlled study and, and then assess the politics around payer view on those various diseases, physician view, et cetera, to think about what the headwinds or tailwinds would be for um, getting the necessary approvals. Thanks. You know, we, we probably could and likely will do an entire webinar on healthcare IT at some point in the future, but we are seeing the intersection of technology, of, of digital technology and traditional medical device starting to intersect more and more frequently with various combined sorts of devices that generate or process data. And would love to get your perspective on that intersection. Is it something that you find very interesting? Is it something that's really crowded with a lot of activity and froth? Uh, you know, is it something that you're just not that interested in right now? Well, so digital health broadly defined can mean a lot of different things. So we have really sliced it down to be Again, something that is related to therapeutics, and that, so that could be wearables. Uh, and I can give you an example in a second. Could even be, you know, we've even looked at some. It's called apps, you know, on your iPhone, but but things that may be helping in the treatment of chronic disease, diabetes, for example, and and where those companies may actually run a clinical trial using that app to show the benefit, right? So again, back to our comment on clinical data and, and therapy. Um, the example I will cite: we 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 did invest in a company. Uh, 12 months or so um, ago, a technology comes out of uh, Stanford. And I can't go into too much of the details, but what I can tell you is it is a wearable, it's a wrist-worn device. Uh, it, it's in the peripheral neurostimulation area, broadly defined, and it's a treatment for essential tremor and Parkinson's disease. And w w what's interesting is, so there's a therapeutic, it's very much a device, but it's a, there's a a digital component to it, and, and, and you can see that in the investor group. So we led the round, but we were joined by J&J uh, and, &J and their device team, but then we were also joined by Google, Qualcomm, and then on the drug side, Novartis and GSK. So it's, it's, a, it's a product bill that sits at the intersection of digital health devices and pharma, and that's why you've seen these various players kind of all come together. So that that is an area we're very interested in. So again, this area of therapeutic wearables, there may be a tie-in back to uh, to the iPhone or not. Um, there's often a neurostimulation or modulation type of component to it. Um, th that's an area of focus for us. Yeah, and I'd add the, um, the whole wearable world, um, clearly the ability to uh, analyze data in the cloud to manage it is, is valuable and um, and can bring real measurable economically important health benefits uh, uh, the, one of the challenges is that sometimes these things really aren't very uh, novel or patentable if you're just collecting you know heart rate data or respiration data or whatever you know, there, there's there's not too much uh, protectability there, and not necessarily a ton of uh, of, of uh, potential health benefit from from that measurement. Uh, I think where things have have often shown more promise 
is when the device ties to a, a, uh, a specific measurement that's done in a different way, often an implantable device. I just point, for example, to CardioMEMS, which is a uh, implantable pulmonary artery pressure monitor, and uh, people quibble about their trial, but roughly speaking, they cut uh, uh, hospitalizations and deaths in half in a population of heart failure patients by monitoring their pulmonary artery pressure on a daily basis and titrating their, their drugs up or down to make sure that they didn't uh, get in a, in a danger zone of acute decompensation. So that's just, just one example of combining a, uh, an implantable device with uh, the, uh, the digital world to provide a, a really significant therapeutic benefit from a diagnostic. Got it. Thanks. Um, one, one changing direction a little bit. I mean, one of the, the, the challenges our tech transfer uh, folks face is, you know, they may have an idea and a, a founder, you know, scientist or physician, but they don't have, you know, an entrepreneur or an executive to kind of pull a plan together, um, you know, make the case, the business case for the idea, and then actually go out and, and try to raise some money to support it. Uh, you know, the tech transfer offices are generally under-resourced and don't have the bandwidth to do that. You know, the founders tend to be faculty or staff physicians who don't have the time or skill set to do that. And, you know, that is an area, even sometimes more so than early stage funding, is, you know, the, the management or experience, you know, the experienced entrepreneur to do that. I mean, any thoughts if you were counseling the, the universities on where they might go to find those people or what kinds of people that you would be receptive to bringing ideas into the, you know, the foundry or, or to Lightstone? Yeah, this is Hanson. Um, you know, the, the medical device community, as I've as said, we, we, as we've discussed, isn't huge. And uh, these companies typically take many years to get through their clinical trials. So... We all get to know each other over time, and and that's really wonderful. It's a very collaborative environment. Uh, people go out of their way to to help each other because uh, because they're going to get help down the road when they have a challenge. So I would reach out uh, to any uh, medical device uh, entrepreneurs in uh, in your communities and. Ask them who to, to go to. There, there are a number of, uh, of uh, groups like the Foundry around the country who are uh, developing, you know, great new things, and, and they might be helpful. There are also a number of, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, contract R&D companies. Uh, just, just of all forms and all specializations, who uh, are available to to do some some early prototyping, often you know for not too much money, in the hope of, of getting more business down the road. So, uh, so there are a lot of resources within the medical device community, and and I would just reach out to them and and ask them. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Hans is right. I think it starts with finding an entrepreneurial mentor. Um, I mean, even the companies coming out of Stanford here locally, where you have this very robust ecosystem, the, the, the entrepreneurs, which in devices tend to be physicians or engineers, those entrepreneurs do typically seek out um, somebody that's done it before. Uh, and and it, again, it can come in the form of an incubator like Hanson or, or, or Mark in the Foundry, and, and there's other groups like that. I think, I think what's different, if you take a step back, if you look at how the biotech companies tend to get started. They tend to be built around a lab or uh, a professor's work within an institution. And it's almost like you're spinning out that lab. And that tends to be the, the, the kernel for um, what then a, a platform type biotech company is built around. If you look at devices, uh, again, it tends to usually come from a doc or an engineer. And I think one of the challenges that we often see on the tech transfer side of the house is um, you need somebody to translate the unmet need piece 
what we often see is really interesting technology, but it's technology looking for an application, and that's hard for venture investors to, to sort through. And what Mark and Hanson do so well is they start with the unmet need, and then they go out and find the technology. And that could come from their own heads, or as Hanson said, it could come out of a various institution. So there needs to be that, that, that person in the middle between the venture community and the technology that's made that translation to the unmet need, or it, it'll be very hard to get traction with venture capitalists because it, it, we can do it, but it's not really our job to do it. We, we just see too many opportunities, and that will we'll discard the opportunity quickly if it's a technology looking for an application. Okay, it looks like we're having an audio challenge here. I don't know, a couple folks have written in that they can't hear. I don't know if we timed out. I think we were supposed to be able to go longer. We are all good right now. Okay, so it may be on their end. Um, thanks, guys. I, you know, we are coming up on the end of our time, and I just wanted to end with a little bit of a lightning round, kind of what's hot, what's not. Um, you know, are there, maybe you could each talk about areas where you are looking for solutions to what you perceive to be uh, meaningful, unmet clinical needs. Uh, yeah, that, um, so, I, you know, I don't know that we approach the world that way. I, and I, I don't, you know, Bill, you've been on my panels with me and you often get asked, so what are you looking for now? Um, uh, it's kind of a. <laughs> it's kind of a prepared. Yeah, it's kind of a prepared mind approach. So we are, you know, I mentioned we are looking at the area of, of peripheral neurostimulation, neuromodulation. We are still looking for big ideas of of devices that may have some novel physiology that could treat a chronic disease like diabetes or hypertension or what have you. I think the manipulation of nerves broadly speaking, Absolutely. is interesting to us. Um, which disease area, et cetera, et cetera, that, that's TBD. But uh, nerve manipulation, either peripherally or implantable, through an implantable or through denervation, we will look at all day long. Yeah, I think that and uh, interventional neuroradiology. Yeah. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so anything with neuro in it uh, is of interest. Uh, I think there's a lot we have to learn. There are going to be some disappointments there, but there are also some just huge opportunities to treat uh, diseases that aren't well managed now. Uh, structural heart, uh, valve therapies, uh, non-surgical valve therapies uh, remains a, a very hot space. And, um, and there have been a number of acquisitions in ophthalmology. Uh, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a sort of a narrow focused field, but it's, it's been, uh, it's been hot. I mean, and I can give you the counter where we tend not to invest, at least Lightstone. Uh, we tend to shy away from orthopedics. We tend to shy away from spine. We never say never, but there's been reimbursement challenges in those spaces. There is um, the acquirers tend to want to see revenues be before acquiring. They're often widgets rather than some sort of a physiologic aha. Um, and so they're gadgets. They're not. They're products, not companies. Um, so that tends to be an area where we see a lot of stuff, but we tend to say no um, a lot there. Biomaterials is another area where we see a lot of stuff that often feels like a technology looking for an application, so we have not done much um, in that area. Um, so I can give you the, the converse as to what tends to be a quick task for us as well. But that said, if someone walked in with a compelling orthopedic device, you'd be all over it. I would be, but but Hanson would say no in a heartbeat. So. No, absolutely. Right? <laughs> we already have one. We're looking for more. Guys, um, I just I think we're going to wrap here. I wanted to just close really with, um, you know, any comments you might have specific to, or closing comments you might have specific to our tech transfer audience. Um, you know, uh, you know these guys struggle with medical device and technology disclosures and innovation. And, uh, you know, this, I think, has been a very informative hour. But any, any closing comments uh, that you might have? Yeah, I, I think, so on the disclosure front, I, I recognize that that's a tricky area. I, but I think at the same time, to Hanson's earlier point and comment, um, the earlier you can have conversations with folks 
And those folks sometimes are venture folks, but sometimes, again, they're this entrepreneurial mentor. You know, I think the better. And, um, you know, I'd say by and large across our industry, people aren't looking to steal ideas, they're, they're, particularly with the institutions. You know, they're going to be willing to put a reasonable deal in place. My ask to this audience would be, I, I put reasonable, you know, in quotes, and there are benchmarks. I mean, it's, it's not like this has never been done. So knowing what the benchmarks are and knowing what the uh, typical terms are is helpful because as long as we can strike a fair and reasonable deal uh, around a particular technology, um, you know, we're more than willing to do that. I think the other thing for folks on this call to remember is it usually isn't one single patent or one single technology. It, it usually, and what Hanson does so well, is goes and gets multiple patents, multiple technologies, again, some invented in his own um, uh, mind and others externally, and you're stitching all those things together. So just keep in mind that it isn't typically one patent. It's uh, a series of patents, and that's going to be reflected uh, in the value uh, as well. Yeah, I think that um, you know the overall message should be that medical devices is alive and well and perhaps more uh, uh, <clears throat> exciting a space than it has been in a long time. And uh, the, um, you know, the changes in the IP world that I'm sure you're all very familiar with, with the ability to file provisional patents very inexpensively, you know, should make it easier to get out and, and test the waters with an idea in a, in a safe way. So, uh, you know, definitely just, just reach out and, um, and see what people think of ideas uh, because, because there are some great opportunities out there. Great, and I think with that, we're going to have to conclude today's uh, seminar. Uh, thanks, Mike and Hansen, for uh, agreeing to uh, be our panelists today and provide what I thought were some very insightful comments. Um, for the audience, if you have any additional questions for our speakers, you can email them to osage at compartners.com, or you can just reach out to any of us individually. Um, you should see a survey link on your screen now or shortly. And we'd appreciate it if our audience could provide us with feedback. Um, this is, as I mentioned, our inaugural webinar, and we'd like to uh, you know, incorporate whatever feedback we get in, in future uh, webinars. So on behalf of Osage University Partners and our panelists, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bill, for organizing this. Okay. Bye-bye, everybody. And this does conclude today's webinar. You may now disconnect.